we have discussed ionic bond in the prior video so we're going to jump into covalent bonding now in this video and covalent bonding as you may recall is formed by two non-metal atoms this plot here illustrates the type of interactions that are formed when a covalent bond forms you basically have two different atoms both non-metals and they don't want to give away their electrons however recall that each one of these atoms also have nuclei in them right and so there's a positive charge residing in the middle of these atoms and so when they get closer together there is attraction between the nucleus of one atom with the valence electron of the other atom and vice versa and so you can see that the valence electron now gets attracted to that nucleus and they want to get closer together now there's a distance at which that interaction is maximized so the stability of the compound in that case is at the maximum point possible which results in the least amount of energy if you bring them closer together at some point the two nuclei are going Going to repel each other and that would not be as stable as this distance right here so whatever that distance is that gives you the maximum stability for that specific pair of atoms that's what we call the covalent bond length for that molecule that's the process of covalent bond formation so it's about the attraction of the nucleus of one atom with the valence electron of the other atom which of course is different than the strength or the attraction that forms in ionic bond where you actually have ions cations and anions that are attracting each other but the basis of that interaction is the same which is electrostatic attraction the Lewis representation or the Lewis structure it's just a tool that we use to illustrate how these bonds are being shared between atoms in a covalent bond. We use dots to represent the valence electrons. For example, sodium has an electron configuration of neon and then 3s1. So the valence electron here is that 3s electron and there's only one of it. So we would draw the Lewis symbol for sodium as Na with a dot. Chlorine has an electron configuration of Ne 3s2 3p5. So the number of valence electron is 7 because 3 is the valence shell. And so we would draw 7 dots around the chlorine symbol. So for example, we have sodium with that one dot and then chlorine with that seven dots. In an ionic bond, what happens is the sodium gives away its single electron to chlorine, forming sodium ion and chloride ion. And so the Lewis structure would look like this, sodium plus, because that's the sodium ion. And the chloride ion would be chlorine with eight electrons around it with a bracket and a negative sign outside it. So that indicates that it's an ion now. So the two ions are placed next to each other to indicate that they're bonded together and you can do this with other species as well whether it's MgO or CaF2. We don't use Lewis structure too often for ionic bonds as for covalent bonding. So here's an example for Cl2. So these two are both non-metal elements. They are going to share that one electron that they have in the middle to make what we call an octet which we will learn more in a little bit. So the chlorine molecule will be illustrated like this where you have two chlorines you have the dots representing one chlorine and then you have the other dots representing the other chlorine and then the electrons are being shared are drawn right in between the two chlorine symbols it's important to differentiate between what we call lone pairs versus bonding pair so lone pairs are pairs of electrons that belong to a specific atom bonding pairs are pairs of electron that are being shared by the two atoms so in this case the cl2 structure each chlorine has three lone pairs which is the one in the bottom left and right for this chlorine and on this one is the one on the bottom right and top the bonding pair is the one that's right in the middle there that's being shared by the two chlorine so there's six lone pairs and one bonding pair in that structure of Cl2 you'll see very often that instead of drawing the bonding pair as a pair of dots like this we would just use a line to represent the bond to make it easy for us to see the bonding versus the lone pairs a concept that will be closely related to drawing Lewis structure for covalent bond would be the idea idea of covalent bond polarity. And to understand this idea, we need to look a little bit at the difference between ionic bond and covalent bond. So with ionic bond, the electron is completely transferred from one species to another, so you actually form full ions. You form a cation and you form an anion. With covalent bond, you're sharing these electrons. However, what we find is that sharing of the electrons is not always equal. So sometimes you have sharing of electrons that are equal for both species involved. Sometimes you see that one species 
species gets more of the shared electrons compared to the other species. When that happens, one species will be more negative and the other species would be less negative. We give these symbols called delta minus and delta positive to indicate which species gets more electron and which species gets relatively fewer electrons. Now this is partially positive and partially negative, unlike an ion where it's fully positive and fully negative. So we want to make sure we differentiate that. That's why we don't just put the positive symbol here, we put the delta positive symbol to indicate it's only partially positive. But you still have these two poles of positive and negative, so we would often call this a dipole. That is an example of a polar covalent bond. When the sharing is equal, then we would call it a nonpolar covalent bond, or sometimes called a pure covalent bond. The way we can determine whether our covalent bond is going to be polar or nonpolar is by using the concept of electronegativity. Electronegativity is just the relative ability of a bonded atom to attract shared electrons. So they're equally strong in attracting the shared electrons, you're going to get a nonpolar covalent bond. If they're not equal in their ability to attract that shared electron, then you're going to get a polar bond. So here's an example when we actually make measurements. So the hydrogen-hydrogen bond has a bond strength of 432 kilojoule per mole, and the fluorine-fluorine bond has a strength of 159 kilojoule per mole. So we might expect that if we make a bond between hydrogen and fluorine, the strength of that bond is going to be halfway between the strength of these two bonds, averaged out, so 296 kilojoules per mole. But what you find is actually that the strength of that bond is much bigger than that number, which is 565 kilojoules per mole. So the explanation for this is made by Linus Pauling. The reason why that bond is much stronger than what we would expect if there's equal sharing is because the sharing is unequal, and because the sharing is unequal, you get this positive-negative poles, and the positive-negative pole, just like in an ionic bond, is actually attracted to each other, resulting in an improved strength of that polar covalent bond compared to when it's just being shared equally. Even though it's partial, it improves the strength of that interaction. So Pauling actually developed what he called an electronegativity scale, which is a measure of how well an atom can attract shared electrons to itself in a covalent bond. So the larger the number here, the more effective that atom is at attracting electrons to itself in a covalent bond. So as you can see, fluorine has the highest number. The metals have very low numbers here, like francium has the lowest one. So we would say that the trend in electronegativity is increasing as you go from the bottom all the way to the top right there, with fluorine being the most electronegative element, followed by oxygen next, which means that they're very good at attracting shared electrons to themselves. Now, of course, it depends on who they're paired with. We can actually use electronegativity differences, which I give a symbol delta En here, to help determine the type of bond that I have. If I calculate the delta En for two elements that are bonded, and they have a value of less than or equal to 0.4, based on the Pauling scale, then I would say that that bond is a nonpolar covalent bond. However, if the value is at least 0.5 to 2, right, because 0.4 is still considered nonpolar, then that would be considered a polar covalent bond. If you have a number bigger than that, then that would be considered ionic. I would emphasize here that this cutoff in scores is not a black and white type situation. It's more like a spectrum, right, where you slowly go from the nonpolar type of interaction all the way to more polar interaction and eventually ionic. In fact, you know, if you want to differentiate between covalent versus ionic, it's easier to think about it as nonmetal, nonmetal versus metal, nonmetal. But for differentiating between the polar and nonpolar covalent bonds, electronegativity difference is a useful tool to calculate in order to help with that. It allows us later on to calculate lowest structures. Let's take a look at this question about using the electronegativity table that we have in our lecture notes to determine what kind of bonds we have and to rank them based on increasing polarity. So we're given these bonds right here, CH all the way to SH, and we have to determine their polarity. So the way you do that is just calculate the difference in electronegativity or delta EN of each of those bonds. So what I've done here is create a table for each of the bond on the left and then just the delta EN that I calculate. And I also attach the electronegativity table that we have in our lecture notes. Now, there is a couple of different scales of electronegativity. This is the one that we use, which is the Pauling scale, where the fluorine is 4.0. If I were to calculate the one for CH, for C is 2.5, for H is 2.1. So I will subtract those two. And typically, you want to get a positive number out of this calculation. So you just find the bigger number and subtract it by the smaller number. In this case, CH will give me 0.4. And I would repeat that with all the other elements 
performance as well, giving me all the numbers that I'm listing right here. And then from there, I'm just going to rank the bonds based on their polarity, starting from the least polar to the most polar. So the least polar would be the lowest value, which is the SH and the CH. So those two are about the same in polarity. And then I will go to the CN, which is the next one. And then afterwards, it should be the NH, and then it should be the CO, and it should be the OH. The next thing you need to do is label for the polar bonds where the delta positive and the delta negative symbols should be, because there's going to be two poles for those type of bonds. So recall that the cutoff for polarity is if you have 0.4, then that would be considered nonpolar bonds. So for the SH and the CH, I'm not going to label anything there because they're considered nonpolar bonds. But once you go to 0.5, given the cutoff we have, we would consider that a polar bond. So the CN is a polar bond, slightly polar bond. In this case, C is less electronegative than N. If you look at the values that's given on the electronegativity table, N is 3, C is 2.5. So C is going to be delta positive and N is going to be delta negative. And you just repeat that for all the other polar bonds as well, all the way to OH. Okay. I'm just going to give a brief overview here of why we want to draw Lewis structure. And the next video will actually show you how to draw Lewis structures. The reason we want to draw Lewis structure is one is that it gives us an easy tool to represent bonding and how bonding occurs in molecules, specifically in two dimensional structures. But as you'll see later on, we can actually take that information from the Lewis structure and apply it so that we can make prediction of the three dimensional shape of simple inorganic and organic molecules. We can also use the information we get from Lewis structure to determine molecular polarity of the species that we draw. And that helps us predict whether two different compounds will mix or will not mix. And then as you'll see in another video, we would talk about the idea of resonance and how the Lewis structure will actually help us determine what we would most likely see in an experiment for that particular molecule. And if you take organic chemistry, you will see that Lewis structures is commonly used to help illustrate how electrons move in a chemical reaction in a reaction mechanism. And the steps of drawing Lewis structures are shown here. And in the next video, I will walk you through each of these steps.